pleasure this evening to introduce uh, Matthew Butcher. Matthew Butcher will be known to many of you. He's a senior lecturer at the Bartlett, and he uh, runs the undergraduate BSc program here. I've been very lucky personally because I have taught with Matthew now for around 10 years in uh, Earmarch Unit, Unit 12. Uh, and it's always been exciting. Uh, it's always been very uh, thoughtful. In, Matthew is always inventive. And I think I would like to thank Matthew because I have gained, gained greatly from our dialogue together. One of the things I think that's um, important to maybe understand Matthew is to realize that he grew up in a, a very creative family. And often I think his attitude to his work is seen in that. Because I think through his family he knew that you actually could instigate a project, not just wait for a commission to come along, and that you had to uh, be very determined, cunning, and totally committed to make it happen. And many, one of the things that's really wonderful about many of the projects that you'll see Matthew discuss this evening, some are commissions, and many of them are very much sort of come to fruition and be made through Matthew's effort and intelligence. Crucially, and I think very uh, rarely these days, for somebody who is an academic, uh, Matthew has also tried to address audi an audience and a readership that reaches far beyond architecture and also the, far beyond uh, the academic field. And one of the ways very simply to judge that is that uh, he has been uh, published uh, and reviewed in the New York Times and The Guardian, for example, in national newspapers, national media. And alongside that, he's been uh, reviewed in the art world, in, for example, the Art, art Monthly and Art Forum. And in architecture, many t places, including the Architects Journal, Architects Review, Blueprint, Domus, RB Journal, and many others. Uh, one of the things that uh, Matthew uh, is always involved with is you'll see that many of his projects are, some are made for an exhibition, and some are an exhibition themselves. They're very much physical entities. And uh, some of the examples of the uh, venues that he's actually exhibited in, uh, the Architecture Foundation and the V&A in London, uh, storefront for art and architecture in New York and the Prague uh, Quadrennial. So it's already quite an amazingly impressive collection of places where his work has been shown. Uh, and one of the things that uh, Matthew did, which I thought was particularly interesting, was to uh, found and edit an architectural magazine, which is paper, which is, uh, which is sorry, pair, which is paper for emerging architectural research. And because he wanted to sort of see a way of actually encouraging debates around what architectural research might be. And I think that one of the ways in which that's sort of formulated uh, now is that he is going to edit, uh, guest edit, with uh, Luke Pearson, an issue of uh, architectural design, which will be titled Reimagining the Avant-Garde. And I think this is very important to Matthew's conception of his work. And I'd say it's also a challenge for all of us today in a rather conservative time architecturally. And therefore, I'm very proud to introduce Matthew today because I think he is committed to practice as discourse, and his, he does work that is beautiful and weird, meaningful and provocative. Matthew Butcher. Um, uh, thank you, Jonathan. That's an extremely um, kind introduction. Uh, and thank you all for coming. Um, it's uh, fantastic to see uh, so many of you here. Um, and lastly, just to thank uh, Bob Scheel and Frederick Mingaru for giving me this opportunity to speak um, in this context. Okay. We have the lights. Um, today I'll be presenting uh, wide range of projects I've really been working on in the last eight years. Uh, but within that, there'll be a focus in the second half of the lecture of where my practice has kind of shifted, uh, which is really looking at kind of drawn and, and speculative architectures. Um, before starting to discuss the work, and by way of an introduction, I would like to state three critical frameworks I feel are necessary to help explain and contextualize these projects. Firstly, are the writings of architect Bernard Schumi, um, in particular, his assertion that there is no architecture without action, no architecture without event, and that the future of architecture lies in the construction of events. Secondly, is an interest in the history of innovative responses to the environment, 
as seen in the history of art, architecture, and performance. In particular, I'm interested in expanding upon the work that emerged in this field from the late 60s and 70s. Within this framework, I'm interested in architects and artists who have engaged in cross-disciplinary experiments, exploring forms of practice that encompass land art, performance art, process art, architecture, the construction of performances, and structures as site-specific works. What is important also about the work of artists who worked in this field is, uh, for me is how they address the relationship or readdress the relationship between occupiers and viewers and the work itself. Within this uh, field of, of, of kind of exploration, um, I'm really interested in the work of Robert Morris, uh, who went from minimalism to performance works to process art and eventually to architectural scale propositions. Also, Alan Capro, who we saw previously on the left-hand side, Robert, uh, Robert Morris on the right, Capro, sorry, Capro on the left, uh, and that's Robert Morris, um, but also Alan Capro, uh, who developed over the course of his career an explicitly political subtext to his happenings, citing the distinct and particular contentious locations such as adjacent to the Berlin Wall and South Central Los Angeles. For architecture um, at this period, Gianni Patano and Raymond Abraham are of whole particular importance. These architects not only engaged in performances themselves, but also set up architectures that explore performative spaces and forms, in that their material state changes, or is perceived to change, in relationship with the conditions such as the environments in which they are located, or through the actions of the people who inhabit them. From Abraham, I have also taken a philosophical cue, uh, not only a philosophical cue, but also a formal one. Um, lastly is the idea that this form of practice is inherently associated with notions of the avant-garde. And within this, my exploration has, has been to reflect specifically how it is influenced in architectural practice. Restaging an architectural avant-garde. Um, I finished college uh, here in 2004. I studied with Jonathan and Elizabeth in Unit 12 uh, for my final two years. And kind of leaving the bar, I have to say, was, um, was hard. <laughs> because it was a very particular time that London was in. And uh, it was the height of the boom. And the architecture scene felt to me, or the architectural practice, was con consumed with the uh, uh, process of building, and almost building for building's sake. And as I kind of tried to submerge myself in uh, the architectural world outside of academia, this kind of obsession, um, I have to say, uh, left me quite dis disillusioned. Um, not because I don't, didn't think building was important, but I think building is extremely important. What I felt was that there wasn't really any critical um, dialogue happening about why this building was happening. It was really, things were going up very, very quickly. Uh, people were going in, were given, being given very large jobs very, very quickly. And I really missed the, the idea of a kind of uh, critical context for, for reviewing this work. Um, it was kind of heightened slightly that I was hanging, well, most of my friends were artists at the time. And uh, certainly they had come out of art school and had done the things that I thought one would do if you came out of a kind of, uh, into a kind of creative practice, you know, setting up. Uh, spaces to exhibit, setting up um, uh, events um, and challenging the nature of their own practice trying to move forward, which is something I didn't necessarily uh, find in the architectural world. It was very hierarchical. There are a few pr practices that were, were doing things that were interesting to me. Um, that was one of them. Um, there were a few others. Um, in tandem to this, that there was also a kind of uh, development within the art world that I was, became in incredibly interested in. And, and that was really uh, a kind of uh, influence on the idea of taking historical references from uh, the past um, and then recontextualizing them into a kind of present context as a kind of form of critique. Um, one of those artists who I had lived with was Pablo Bronstein, um, who uh, developed this uh, kind of idea that you that he his drawing was a performance, but when he was drawing or making a drawing, it was a performance that he was in a kind of process of role play. Um, there was also Pillangalia Collective, who were kind of doing performances very much kind of out of the Bauhaus. 
um, and there was also Goshka Makuga, who took um, the architectons, Malevich's architectons, and kind of used them as, as elements of display, whereas previously they, they didn't have any function. And I just want to talk briefly about this notion of, of this recontextualization of history, or, or in kind of performance terms, it's, it's titled kind of reenactment. And it's, um, it's a theorist, Rebecca Schneider, who understands reenactment as a mechanism that troubles linear temporality by offering at least the, the suggestion of reoccurrence or return, even if the practice is peppered with its ongoing incompletion. This sentiment is echoed by Catherine Wood, curator of performance of contemporary art at the Tate, who describes this process as a means of treating art history, not as a fixed set of facts with an e inevitable outcome in the present, but rather an open space of conf conflict being continually reenacted. So, coupled with my frustration, but also essentially engaging with these kind of ideas of emerging in the art world, I kind of set about this idea of restaging an architectural avant-garde. So, one of the things we did performances, um, it's one of the first things I did when left the Bartlett, it's myself and you might recognize Chikit Lai, uh, undergraduate tutor, um, and Max Dudney and uh, Ruth. Um, and then we also redid, we did a kind of performance at an art event, Itchy Park, where we got other people to kind of uh, reenact themselves as buildings. Um, as Jonathan said, I also set up a newspaper uh, called Pair. And uh, the kind of conversations that I had with the graphic designer early on was very much about the idea of somehow creating a symbol or this reference back to um, the avant-garde that we understood from the kind of earlier 20th century. So the kind of graphics you developed was very much this kind of black and white print um, to kind of uh, refer back or echo back to that period. It's on the pages in the paper. Um, I also uh, started to work um, on performances and because uh, this was something the avant-garde did and felt something I should do. Um, and this was actually a piece that I did with my mother. Uh, Jonathan uh, mentioned a bit about my background. My mother was a choreographer, uh, Rosemary Butcher, and she quite late on in the development of the project asked me and uh, who I was uh, a colleague I was working with at the time, Melissa Appleton, to come in and develop a kind of set for her. And what we decided to do was create a series of uh, notations uh, based on Bernard Jumi's Manhattan transcripts. So it was the kind of first point at which this kind of echo with a past project kind of emerged. Um, so we used this kind of graphic notation, but actually took uh, the cues from the choreographer to juxtapose the movements that were happening on the stage with then what was happening in the, um, in the slides. And these are some of the notations. And there was kind of elements of serendipity. We never were able to get the choreography to exist uh, in tandem with the, with the performance. Um, they, uh, it, the, the skill of the dancer really uh, enabled there to be a reflection of the body's movements in, in relationship to the, the movements of, of, of the elements of these notations. Um, and then I also designed cities, which is what also the avant-garde did. Uh, and this is another piece that I did, uh, worked on with Melissa Appleton that was um, exhibited at the BNA, and it was a a project that was initially uh, commissioned by a curator by Beatrice Galilee, and um, it's called Stage City. And it was this idea of a single moment in time uh, existing forever. And it was a, a city that was based partly on London, but we'd extracted all of the um, spaces that we felt had performative potential, or were in some way anthropomorphic, that they were bodies, that you could read buildings as bodies, such as the Hayward Gallery, or. Um, uh, the uh, telecommunications tower, these became figures, but then also kind of staircases that projected the body into kind of endless movement. And it was in this kind of reflective box uh, when you looked in it. And it was kind of reference to the Super Studio and Arcazine who'd done similar kind of pieces themselves. And with some of the photos of what it might be like to live in this city. Um, and then Working with Melissa, again, uh, we moved on to actually develop the notion of an architecture as an event. And this came, this idea uh, kind of primarily manifested in a commission from a, 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 a college in Essex called Rittle College. 
and they came to us asking us to develop a structure that in some way celebrated the history of the, of the, the college, which was historically an agricultural college and then moved to a kind of landscape design school. And in our early research, what we discovered was that uh, the college was actually the site of the first ever bro broadcast by my Marconi engineers. And they went to a hut, which is the hut you see on the left, um, and kind of tested different types of broadcasting techniques um, just kind of in their spare time. And through this process, rather than kind of sending each other beeps across the Atlantic or beeps to their friends uh, in Scotland, is that they developed uh, what we understand as radio. They started to, to read books and they started to uh, get people in to sing or have conversations. So radio really started from this hut and that was our, our starting point for what became essentially a kind of temporary radio station uh, site in Essex. So the site uh, for um, Riffle College and the project Riffle Calling, this is the, the kind of red square that you see, um, that's Chelmsford uh, on the left. Just going to give you an idea where it is. It's a really, one of the things that really fascinated also about this site was the notion that we were, we were outside London but just. And it was kind of very strange amalgamation of different, um, uh, different types of occupation, temporary occupation, there was kind of uh, uh, different types of communities there, um, rural communities, um, urban communities, or suburban communities, principally. And we were really asking ourselves what kind of structure could exist in this kind of place, and this idea of broadcasting potentially back to London. These, that's a photo of one of the, the broadcasts, and then there's another photo of a hut. Um, one of the questions we asked ourselves is, as I say, is what, what, would, what would be the form of an architecture that would somehow resonate with this place? And uh, Melissa and I did this drive along the A12, and we stopped all of the kind of buildings or structures that we thought were interesting and took a photograph very quickly, just out of the window. And then we turned them all into this, these silhouettes, which we see four of them here, where we didn't change the scale, and, but we abstracted them enough to kind of generate a kind of form from, and you see a kind of barn on the left, a gatepost, uh, a um, tower, an agricultural tower, and then a kind of scaffolding. And then we kind of amalgamated these forms, if you like, just as silhouettes into this kind of singular structure here that had a kind of plasticity to it, um, you know, without rechanging the scale of those elements. So the kind of arm element at the back is actually reference back to the gatepost. And then we reapplied these um, materials of that area of the Essex landscape, the kind of bitumen tiles, uh, the weatherboarding, the scaffolding, as the kind of materiality. <coughs> and that's the site plan, which I really like. The cross in the field. And then it, that's the structure built, and, and um, we obviously had to put walls on it, because uh, the radio... say that they're in the, the photos are by Brotherton Lock and, and, and um, Tim and I, Tim Brotherton went to the field one day, it was just like the perfect day to take photograph, these photographs, so to thank him very much for that. Um, so alongside the structure was also um, a key part of the project was the development of this uh, kind of week-long program of events and radio broadcasts um, and really we were asking um, academics, uh, artists, architects, writers, uh, sound artists to come and respond to uh, the theme of the landscape uh, in Essex. And each night had a slightly different theme where we started underground, was the first night, then we went to ground the second night, we went to a horizon for the third night, and then eventually up into ether, uh, which was the last night. And we, we broadcast for about an hour and a half on an FM band, um, which we bought license from Ofcom. Um, and that was the kind of radio, some of the events. And it's really, all that, I kind of showed the photo of the structure initially, but the more I've gone on to see this project, it is absolutely about how it was used as this kind of radio, uh, uh, radio shack, if you like. The occupation and the, the kind of event of it within the landscape was as critical to the understanding of the actual form itself. So photographs like this, for instance, is as much the architecture as actually the building itself. It's the kind of culmination of setting up. This is the final kind of live event. Um, I'm just going to uh, play a, a, a brief bit from the radio uh, 
um, broadcast. This is um, an artist called Fabian Peak who drew on the structure, and uh, which broke my heart, I have to say. But um, no, it really did. Uh, but it, I, I understand it was necessary. Um, so I'm just going to play a bit. Uh, <laughs> uh, play a bit from the, his radio broadcast. What you'll hear at the beginning is that if anyone noticed at the top of the radio tower, there was a there was a, a set of Aeolian harps that were um, installed. Um, and these played essentially when we, um, which were an, by an artist called Mac Beasley, uh, that essentially played when we weren't um, uh, uh, doing the kind of uh, traditional broadcast. Okay, so here we go. <laughs> Men taking gun whales, in so far talking of which Warrell super, super, super dense. Argument see not big enough for envy or the overworld or the overwall. Over the all, all the over wall and world, and world and wall. Say again, say again. Something, no doubt, spell that if you can. Without a wall, even wood. Be Lust for buttons. Many, 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 many more. More, more. Getting Files, mass, behind the field mounting, filled mass. A road, leading but to never the funny road. from the moon. Whose inhabitants count themselves will scatter words. Seeds of learning was an advantage. Um, what you heard him doing there was uh, essentially a kind of talking to him, a recording of himself. This kind of weird language he's invented, and then him also drawing that language onto the, the structure. Um, one of the things that Melissa and I uh, talked about a lot was was the notion that the radio, the extent of the, the broadcast zone that we had, which was a kind of 10, 10 kilometer zone, was the edge of the architecture. And that this idea that you could be driving along with your radio tuned into the, to the necessary band, and that by passing at that borderline, you would be entering the architecture. And um, my own experience of that was, was actually during Fabian's performance when I had to take the previous performer to a taxi. And I, I, listened, I was listening to Fabian's uh, talk uh, on my own radio, walking around the site of Rittle. It was a very kind of strange, uh, kind of slightly disembodied experience, um, kind of dislodging of place and, and site. And that's Mark Lecky, the performance he did. And then the photograph again of the final event um, on the, the last day of the structure and the performances. That's Kevin Atherton, another artist who, who did a performance talking to himself, uh, a version of himself from the 1960s. Kind of at sunrise. Um, the next project, before moving on to the, the, the uh, next section, is was actually done the last 
big piece of work I worked on, but I think it is in many ways a kind of echo of the radio station. And I think this uh, was a, um, an invited competition that we went to. Uh, uh, I was invited to, and then I invited um, two colleagues, uh, Kieran Wardle and um, Owen Williams, to come in and work with me on it. And I think that I was invited to do the competition because they'd heard of um, the people that, that were running it had um, seen and heard of the radio station. And it was a competition run by um, Hexham Book Festival and Arts and Culture, uh, kind of uh, auxiliary supported by Peter Sharp from um, Kilda Art and Architecture. And the brief was to design a kind of traveling art space or arts venue. Um, and alongside the structure, um, Hexham Book Festival had commissioned uh, 10 poets to write um, stories uh, or poems about the theme of borders. And the idea was that the structure would travel from the northeast to the northwest, stopping at uh, locations on the um, Hadrian's Wall uh, kind of border. Um, and uh, that our, the Mancio structure, which is what it called, would be a kind of place to stop and have tea, to look at videos of the uh, performers, uh, uh, um, the poets and the performers reading their work, um, and also to then kind of look at the ruins. Um, but it was also a, a kind of slight political project in the sense they'd set up with the Arts Council the idea that this would go to uh, places that were traditionally quite hard for um, the Arts Council to get uh, visitors to, uh, particularly extremities to the northeast and the northwest. So the kind of first question I think that we asked ourselves when we were designing was the notion um, really ab about how you can design a structure or an architecture which obviously has such a strong context yet your context is, is continually moving. Um, and, uh, um, you know, without the parameters of a, a very particular site or, you know, the adjacency of buildings, what are the elements that you can uh, derive that, that allow a building to have a kind of resonance with where it is? So I think similar to the radio station, we worked on this idea of what would the, what would the structure pass or could we take the road or the, the notion of the traveling as the actual site. So um, the influences that we were taking, we were looking at uh, the kind of the, the industry there, um, the elements of the roadside, uh, kind of architectures, if you like, um, but then also the ruins of the places it, it would be sited and the kind of suburban context it would pass through. And this was, these were the, this was actually the competition drawings, the idea that it would kind of fold down, um, go on the back of a lorry, which was one of the key elements of the brief, um, and that it would be kind of assembled. And that, this drawing is quite useful, although the, the, you'll see the design changed. You'll see the elements that, that we needed within the architecture was kind of room, video room, uh, a place to uh, stop for tea, um, and then a place to kind of read the poems and books. And, and the language, the material language, particularly of that kind of weird hinterland that you get uh, within the Northeast, you know, traveling from town where there's a lot of kind of industrial complexes in a way um, that we were trying to reflect. Uh, within this architecture, both formally and materially. We, we changed the design uh, for several reasons. Logistically, you know, the initial idea of putting on the, on the lorry didn't work because some of the sites were so delicate that we couldn't actually get the lorry um, into uh, some of those locations that we planned. Um, but also cost um, that kind of changed certain elements, although hopefully it kept um, some of its uh, identity. Oh yeah, heights, bridges of heights. Heights of bridges are very important. That wouldn't have gone in these under bridges. Um, uh, uh, no, no, I learned a lot about bridge heights. Uh, that's one of the drawings, um, actually, of the final structure that Owen did, if you can see it. And then kind of final render. And then that's the structure in its first location in, in Arlanda, which is actually on the outskirts of Newcastle and was, was designated by the Arts Council, one of the areas that, that is hard to reach. Um, so kind of traveled out there. And the whole idea was that it would kind of fold up and close down, not only to travel, but also to, um, depending on the weather. Um, but you'd have this kind of stage area where you could kind of set performances from. And these are kind of two of the other locations it's at. The, the tower was, um, had several functions, but it really was uh, this idea of, of a kind of a marker in the landscape. And the, the Peak District, if anyone knows, you kind of, wind, sorry, not Peter Street, but the, the area where it, um, al along Hadrian's Wall, you do drive these kind of meandering roads and this idea that you might see this tower kind of emerge within this kind of landscape. 
and the people occupying it. It's you out. I quite like that photo in the sense it's kind of, you know, talk about the avant garde, it, it, it feels somehow to me referencing back some of those, uh, those architects, the kind of notion of white. It, it feels quite super studio esque. And then this idea of this thing uh, it kind of emerging and disappearing, you know, it's kind of almost ephemeral event, kind of ghost like structure that, that somehow captures the light and then kind of goes on to another, another part of the country. Okay, um, so this is really the second half of, uh, moving on to the second half of the, of the lecture. Um, and really the next body of work I think can be seen as a kind of singular entity. And um, it's really, uh, I suppose this work really started to develop again for me in about 2012 when I started to, I suppose, operate more within the academic context. Um, most of the other projects that have been done while teaching, but they've been kind of self-funded or through commissions. Um, and it was really a kind of refocus on a kind of drawn practice. And I actually, although I'd been continuing ideas that I had developed from my diploma in 2004, it gave me an opportunity to kind of go back and, and reflect on some of those, those works that I'd done because I felt they had a complexity um, that I hadn't quite necessarily managed with the, the other projects. Uh, where there's kind of, um, series of layers to them and actually take some of the things that I'd learned uh, from the kind of performances or the explorations into kind of reenactment into that, um, into that work and into that world. So most of these projects are, are focused in the site of the Thames Estuary and uh, really the idea of um, what will happen to this landscape, or what is happening to that land, to this landscape, as um, uh, we have a continued threat of, of rising sea levels. But also, what is happening to this landscape anyway through um, increased industrialization and through developments of, of proposed developments of housing, Thames Gateway, um, to a very, very delicate kind of ecosystem. Although it doesn't seem delicate, it is, it is very delicate. So, um, the site for these, uh, these propositions started in a, in a place called Cliff in Kent, which is uh, just past Gravesend. And it's a very, very strange part of the world. It's very flat. And it is basically kind of reclaimed marshland. Um, and you can just about see in the distance the seawall, which is essentially stopping the, the Thames um, infiltrating that, that landscape. And one of the first things I did, um, or had worked on for quite a long time, was to redo a OS map uh, of Cliff uh, as if the seawall had been demolished and actually just kind of imagine what that landscape would look like. And um, this, is, uh, this is what would happen. I'm just using my cursor. That basically is the, where the seawall kind of sits now. So the river's there. So if you remove that seawall, the the, literally the Thames would just kind of infiltrate that whole landscape. Um, after that, I kind of supposed to, I, I, I started to ask questions about what kind of um, architectures might exist within this landscape. Um, just to say, this is uh, a picture of um, Abbott Hall Farm in uh, Essex, where they've actually done that, where they've, they've breached the seawall. It's, it, it is a, 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 a potential mechanism to help with um, threats from flooding because it alleviates pressure. So it allows, it gives space for water to kind of go over, which takes pressure from further up, upstream. Um, it's a diagram of, of kind of showing how that might happen kind of daily or seasonally. And then this is actually a drawing I did in my diploma um, of a kind of, vernac what I called a kind of flood vernacular at the time, which is an architecture made of sediment and reeds and nets. And the idea of a kind of infrastructure that, that would kind of emerge and disappear and be controlled by a series of, of nets. And a series of kind of houses that might get blown or pulled along the water. Um, that you would very much work with the landscape. So the first um, new building, if you suppose, I proposed outside of the, outside of the diploma within this environment uh, was called the filter house. And uh, what I was the question I was interested in asking myself was, if you were living in that environment, what would you need? 
principally. And one of the, the key things that you would need is access to kind of clean water. So I looked at proposing a architecture which would be uh, both a house, a place to live, to dwell, uh, but also one that would, would filter water. Um, and that's the filter house. And within the bell jar space here, water at high tide would come in here, get steam, steamed here through the kind of distillation process, and that chamber would steam up um, and then change views back through the building, um, uh, but also back over to the landscape. And there was a second chamber that you can just see in there, which was a place you could kind of occupy while that was happening. And the building in some way would reflect um, the operations of the landscape. It's kind of model of the interior and then kind of steamed. Um, and then this drawing was from the internal bell jar looking out the landscape when the steam isn't there and then, and then when it is there. And what I was, just to say something about the kind of process of drawing, um, I was very conscious that I wanted the drawing, the process of which to draw was uh, a way of not only communicating the materiality of the project, but the process itself was somehow analogous with the process of the building, if that makes sense. And I was fascinated by the notion of the photocopier, that you could put this drawing through the photocopier and every time you put it through it would change or it would degrade. And uh, in some way, the, the analogy of the process of, of re-photocopying these drawings was the way that the building itself was changing or would be in a constant kind of state of flux. There's never really any key point that the building would exist. Like there isn't any one key uh, photocopy that would be a representation of the building, if that makes sense. This is a, a, a view looking through into the second building. You'll see it's a mirror. The building is two buildings that are mirror. I was kind of playing with this, this idea of that not only would it allow you to live in this landscape and be a reflection of this landscape, but also could be a reflection of the state of mind of those inhabiting the building. So the reflection is a kind of psychoanalytic imagery. Uh, the idea of looking, in a building is looking into a mirror of itself. The idea of the bell jar steaming when the, when the uh, flood comes in is a kind of warning or anxiety over the fact that the flood may never recede. And that's, I suppose, a close-up of the bell jar. This is idea, again, of like the radio waves were the architecture, the steam is also the architecture. Um, and then, obviously, I was quite aware that I was doing a project that was uh, speculative, if you like, and I was quite interested that you could play with that idea. And I s decided to draw the project as though it were part of the Manhattan transcripts. Um, and so I did this drawing in the style of the Manhattan transcripts that also highlighted what you could argue as the kind of formative um, elements of the building, kind of moving backwards and forwards between the bell jars, the bell jar steaming, and then the flood uh, rising and falling. I also drew uh, the filter house as, as though it were part of the Smithsons patio and pavilion, which is the kind of project they did as an installation with Pelopsi uh, in the White Chapel about 55 in an exhibition. And it's always been a project uh, that's been very influential for me, Patio and Pavilion, and I quite like the idea that it influenced the filter house and that somehow I could draw this as though it were uh, a kind of homage to that project. And the homage really is that Peter Smithson had said that, that Patio and Pavilion was the kind of essence of, oops, um, was the kind of essence of existence, that you just need shelter from the rain, a piece of nature and, and access to machinery and art, which is kind of what 